Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Today's episode of Success Insight is another addition to our Outdoor Adventure Series, and it's a pleasure to introduce you to Rolf Rohner. Now, Rolf captains a Boeing 777-300ER for an international carrier, and when he's not working in the cockpit, his interest includes landscape astrophotography and deep space photography. Ralph has authored numerous articles about astrophotography, which have been published on the Milky Way Photographer's website. And really, I have to share, I first learned about Ralph's work as I was beginning to learn about astrophotography, because as you, most of you know, all of you know, I live out here in Las Vegas, and we have lots of dark skies, lots of access to the stars. And when I started to see Ralph's work over and over again on Facebook, I was thinking, I need to meet this man. His work is wonderful. So Ralph, welcome to Success Insight Podcast and the Outdoor Adventure Series. Hi, everybody. My pleasure. Fantastic. And for our listeners benefit, Ralph, where are you located right now? I'm based in Switzerland, near the biggest city in Switzerland, uh, which is Zurich, about 12 kilometers north of the city. Gotcha. I have never been to Switzerland. Now that I know you, it's definitely on my to-do list. (laughs) That's good. (laughs) Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your background, just to give our listeners a little bit of a flavor for who you are and what you do. Okay. Yeah. I was born in Switzerland, actually in the city of Zurich. Um, I did my normal schooling there, college, um, started university and medical school to become a doctor. And parallel, I was applying uh, with... uh, the company that was called Swiss there by then as a pilot. And then after two years, I switched from the university to pilot school and became a pilot for Swiss there until they went bankrupt in 2001 after the 9-11 incidents. And then the new company, which is called Swiss International Airlines, uh, took over and I started flying for them. And I've been a captain now since 2013 and uh, since two years, I'm uh, flying the long haul the big planes for us, uh, which is the point triple seven three hundred ER. My family, I'm uh, married. I have uh, two kids, a uh, twin boy and girl, which are nine years old right now. And as you said, my favorite hobby is uh, astrophotography. Fantastic. Well, to, to say the very least, in more ways than one, you have your hands full, yeah. both family, kids, and you have all of your guests, passengers on your flights. They're in your hands. Yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> quite literally, actually. <laughs> I have the plane in my hands and everybody's sitting inside, so I have them in my hands as well. But they, they can feel safe. <laughs> oh, most definitely. And I'm curious, before we kind of dive in more into the astrophotography, you were in medical school, and then did you just decide, you know, I, I think this is not the life for me. I want to no, fully... Not at all. Basically, uh I grew up next to the airport of Zurich and uh, saw the planes flying by every day when I was a kid. Um, I was actually interested in aviation. My father as well, he, who didn't work in aviation, but he was a big fan of the airplanes. And so he took us as a kid uh, to the airport to watch the, the planes take off and land. So I actually always uh, kind of felt connected to uh, aviation. And then uh, you have to be 20 to apply as a pilot. So they had like uh, roughly uh, 1,000 applications and they took like 80 every year. So the chances were not very good to be taken by them. So you have to have a, as an alternate plan, as we say, as pilots. Um, that's why I started medical school. Um, if they wouldn't have taken me as a pilot, then I would obviously have said finish their university and probably a doctor. <laughs> and that's my patience in my hands now. <laughs> well, I have to say that's a good problem to have, though, Ralph. Yeah. It's a good problem yeah. to have. Actually, yeah, because yeah. the the whole uh, process, screening process and stuff, that took like one and a half years. So, so that's why it took like two years uh, until I got the go-ahead from uh, Swiss Air uh, to join their pilot training program, which actually was uh, quite nice because in the U.S. Uh, you have to pay for yourself. I, I got my, my pilot's license paid by the, by the company. You know, uh, I have to say, you know, not to get political, but things are done very well over in Europe. Certain things, I mean, we all have our challenges, (laughs) but certain things are done very well. I find it 
very comforting to hear growing up myself in the Detroit suburbs, Detroit, Michigan. We were on the flight path for one of the runways at Detroit Metropolitan Airport. Okay. And it was typically in the afternoons. And it was just fun to watch those airplanes just come over the house. And we were, I don't know, it's like 20 miles away. But yeah. still, it's like, wow. And there's just something about airplanes and watching them land, watching them take off, especially the big ones, because it's it's an amazing feat of engineering and science, physics, it that it can happen. And when you had shared that your father had taken you to the airport, I, I, my parents took us, my sister and I, to the airport also to to watch the, the flight. So I, I appreciated that story. When did you first become interested in either photography or the astrophotography? When did that start to occur? Well, photography uh, was basically in uh, 1991. It was uh, when I came over to uh, San Diego for uh, three months to learn English, actually. And uh, I took a camera with me. And the U.S. landscapes are just awesome. So it was uh, yeah. on my weekends, I was uh, driving around and taking pictures, uh, daylight pictures uh, at that time of, of the landscapes. So that's when I started uh, was photography. I uh, still was uh, film, nothing digital uh, at those days. Mm -hmm. As a photographer, I mean, myself, I appreciate that. You start taking pictures wherever you're at. You carry your camera everywhere you go. Yeah. When I, did the this interest in astrophotography start to take off? Well, that was uh, the end of the 90s when I bought my first telescope. Actually, in, uh, in college, I was telling everybody I was uh, study astronomy because uh, I was reading those cosmology books and I was uh, very impressed in those topics and I always told everybody I, I will study astronomy then uh, when I came back actually from San Diego I changed my mind I, I said okay now I'll rather become either doctor or pilot so I'll, I'll try that and then uh, in the in the end of the night I think it was uh, 98 or something I bought my first telescope did some visual astronomy first, then as it is quite normal, as if you own a telescope, you want to start taking images through the telescope. So I started with a deep sky photography, like uh, around 2000. I can imagine that the ability to take deep sky photography at that time versus here we are 2021, the technology has changed, the capabilities have changed. Completely changed. Yeah. What were your deep sky objects that you were shooting? Well, I wasn't a uh, very good deep sky photographer at that time. I was still working with uh, this film so or, or di uh, dia films. So um, I was mainly uh, shooting the the bright targets like uh, Orion Nebula, like Andromeda Galaxy, and, and really the, the obvious things you start with when you start doing a uh, deep sky. Well, I was still guiding manually, and uh, yeah, was quite a different uh, hobby. I think it's really amazing what you just said. You know, people start off with the bright objects, Andromeda Galaxy, the Orion Nebula, because that next to the Milky Way, that's exactly what I have been doing. And I'm like, look what I did! Look what I did! That's good because that's the easiest stuff. It's not easy at all, but it's the easiest the uh, targets. So it's it's good to start with them. And uh, it also gives you a, a feeling of achievement. If you got you get your first deep sky object on your screen or on, on print in those days, and then, hey, hey, that's not just in a, in a magazine. That's, that was me taking this image. It's, it's actually there. I saw it. And that's a great feeling. One thing I think is interesting, too, is you started off with the telescopes. My background I was in the IT space for a while as a business consultant. Then I became a coach, a leadership development coach. But I was a photographer. It's how I paid my way through school. And I noticed there's two paths to the astrophotography space. There's the individual who had the interest in astronomy, bought the first telescope, and as you said, wanted to eventually capture what they were seeing, which is the route you took. And then there's the photographer like me who is like, Okay, I, I know I'm a good photographer. I love being out underneath the stars. That's why for me, Las Vegas, or at least the surrounding areas of Las Vegas are fantastic. Yeah. And so my next question was, how do I do this? Yeah. As you started to kind of accumulate your experiences of the photography, where did you find yourself going to take these pictures? Actually, I started doing landscape astrophotography in, uh, in the U.S. 
it was uh, 2015, and I was with my my kids for uh, four then, and uh, we did a camping trip as a camper for three and a half weeks. And uh, for this trip, I bought the new camera, which was a Canon 7D Mark II, which was much a better camera than the the 20D I was using to that day. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was also the days when the first trackers uh, became popular. So as I was doing astrophotography through the telescope, it was uh, obvious for me I had to track the sky to get the better uh, results or less noise. So I bought one of these little trackers and took them along on our on our camping trip. And uh, we were driving around and uh, doing the normal sightseeing uh, tourist stuff uh, during the day. And at night, when the family was sleeping, I was outside and uh, shooting stars. And that's when I took my first uh, landscape astrophotography shots. And I think the first image I ever did was in Monument Valley. They have a very nice campground there where you have the whole view of the of the Monument Valley. And I was just sitting in front of my camper and, and shooting up all night because it was so awesome. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, there was a shot at Monument Valley showed up on um, Facebook this week. It was the main road into the, one of the main roads into the valley. You see the the monuments yeah. and they, they, uh, they set up the shot. In fact, there's, there's some astrophotography icons and, and by the way ralph i would consider you an icon and yeah, so don't, don't let this go to your head okay <laughs> however they live here in las vegas i, I want to meet them but they took the shot at monument valley and i was there a couple of years ago with a colleague of mine i remember just getting up early just to see the stars and it never even dawned on me to want to take pictures of them Couple, I have two. Well, one question, but before I uh, uh, about the word landscape photography, because I'd like you to explain that. But before I do, I do want to acknowledge the fact that you you said, "Here's the camera I have, the Canon 7D Mark II," and I specifically recall in your sh- in the sh- in preparing for the note uh, show today is you didn't really want to get into a discussion about which camera. Did, should I get? But uh, I was trying to honor that request, but you brought it up. But by the way, I, I shoot cannons myself, and so I I appreciate that. So, but uh, <laughs> we don't have to talk about the cameras. Uh, well, it's uh, basically it doesn't matter which brand you use; they're they're all good. Yeah. Well, and I think too is you you just have to go out and do it. Just go yes. out and try it. And I mean, the worst camera is the camera that's. Uh, catching dust instead of light. Yes, very much so. And, and you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I came out here, I had a, my camera is probably 15 years old. It's an old Canon EOS 20D. And I think yeah, that's the ISO, what I started with digital photography. Yeah, and the, the ISO only went up to 800. Yes. And so I was really limited in my dark sky work because yeah. of the sensitivity. And so I ended up, if I had had a tracker at the time, which I didn't even know what a tracker was, I could have overcome that issue. But exactly. having said that, uh, I now have my sets on what I do want, and but we're not going to have that discussion. <laughs> but uh, so tell us a little bit uh, more about astrophotography. You've used this term landscape astrophotography a couple of times. Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I was asked what it was what's called deep sky, deep sky photography. Mm-hmm. So that's when you shoot through a telescope normally or a, or a telephoto lens and you just shoot the sky. That's the classic astrophotography. And you don't have any foreground in, in the image. And then most probably like uh, 2010 or so when, when the first cameras hit the market uh, that were capable uh, to go to higher ISO, and you were able to capture the stars and the foreground, and the stars without star, star trailing. Obviously, you could do uh, star trail shots uh, before with landscape in it, but not the Milky Way shots we, we know now with uh, pinpoint stars and the landscape in it. So that's basically what we call landscape astrophotography, because it's a landscape, and you have to star sky above it. You know, it, it was interesting. There was a, a, you know, and you know this as well, but you're active on social media. 
is once you start searching for a topic, you know, you want to learn more about all of a sudden everything about that topic shows up in your, on your threads. And there was a shot of the, I forget what, it, what this was. It, it's a, a Petra. I think it was in, in Petra's in Jordan, I believe. Jordan. Yeah. And there was a shot of the Milky Way coming right up above Petra. Now, somebody had brought up, that's impossible, just given the orientation. I don't know. I've never been there. It is impossible. <laughs> I know the shot. <laughs> yeah. And so what a lot of people don't realize is, I mean, you can take landscape photography with minimal star trailing, have, have very pinpoint sharp imagery up in the stars. But there's a lot of processing that goes on beforehand yeah. to make it really good. And yes. so you, you take the, the landscape shot and then you integrate in the, the dark sky. Exactly. Okay. Uh, well, you, you can obviously do it from a fixed tripod. You just bump up your eyes to 6,400 or even 12,000, 800 or so, some other cameras. And then you, you take a, a short enough exposure so you don't have any star trading. Problem with that is you probably end up with a very dark foreground where you have to lift the shadows quite a bit uh, in, uh, in post-processing to have uh, anything else than, than just a silhouette. And um, obviously with such a high eye so, and the rather short uh, exposure time you need to avoid star trailing, you look at a, a pretty noisy image. Right. Of course, you can uh, apply some noise reduction in, uh, in post-processing, but that will destroy your details. Uh, so you will not end up with, with uh, an extremely high quality shot. So what uh, we do, actually, I, I think I was one of the first, I didn't invent that, but I was probably one of the first applying it because what you do is... Uh, to do stacking so you stack different images you take the same shots like 10 times and then you just uh, stack those 10 times uh 10 shots on top of each other and you, you take a, a median of, of these 10 shots and that makes the noise go away obviously in the sky that will uh, produce again star trailing so you have to have some software that uh, matches the, the stars on top of each other or you use a tracking mount but then you have to shoot the foreground of the sky separately and you have to merge them again in post-processing. So there's, uh, as you said, there's quite a bit of processing going on, uh, even without uh, bumping the contrast or anything. We're just talking about uh, putting the different part of the images together, which are not single exposures anymore. And that, as you said, of course, offers the possibility to do... Uh, fakes or uh, I, I like uh, and community calls them uh, um, composite images I right. don't like that expression uh, very much because uh, in deep uh, based astrophotography a composite is just uh, an image made up of more than one sub exposure but, but that doesn't mean it, it's it's a fake so I like to call I don't like to call them fakes because it's digital art after all. I call them uh, image collage, digital right. art collage. Um, the, the big difference is that the sky is not in the correct position or might not even have been taken from the same spot. I mean, you can take a, a southern hemisphere sky and, and put it on top of a foreground that was taken in the northern hemisphere. It will sure. look weird if you know the place, but if you don't know, you probably won't notice yeah. And one thing I, I just want to share is, and I, I again, I, I read this online as a, education from an education perspective, is even the uh, the panoramic shots of the Milky Way. And yeah. I, I don't know for a fact, perhaps you can take the entire arc of the Milky Way, but it wasn't until I started to read that these are actually panoramic. It's a, it's a shot of multiple yeah. pa panoramic images, and then you're just... Exactly. Stitching them I'll together. So so <laughs> yeah. It's the time now in spring to do that. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> because the Milky Way is pretty, the, the arch is not too high. Yeah. So, Ralph, I'd love to get into as you were beginning to explore the hobby, you're, you know, you're, you're making this phot photography experience as a part of your daily life. You know, you're going on vacation with the family and they're going to bed and you're, you're spending your nights outside. <laughs> Where are some of the places that you really have enjoyed 
going to, you know, either because you knew it was going to be a great opportunity. And by the way, to our listeners, a great opportunity is when there is little to no moon. So I guess the question I would ask you, Rolf, do you plan your vacations around the new moon? Exactly. <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> Where are some places that you have gone that like, this is fantastic, or I really enjoy this and I can't wait to get back to see what I've captured? Yeah, well, one of my favorite regions is, is the Four Corners region in the in the U.S. Uh, I mean, uh, Southern Utah, uh, Northern Arizona. That's just the uh, awesome uh, foregrounds. Because if you do landscape astrophotography, it's not sh- just about the stars. I always say an image you should should even work without the sky. So the foreground. They are just awesome with all these desert uh, landscapes. They're overwhelming. I grew up in the mountain uh, country and those uh, deserts, they just blow me away. So that's where I was shooting uh, quite a lot. That's uh, also because, uh, why probably my name is, is more known in the U.S. than it's uh, in Switzerland. I was doing like uh, four years. I was doing uh, specific trips, just me alone for uh a week to 10 days around the moon, obviously, uh, just to go uh, into the desert and, and shoot those uh, landscape astrology or nightscape images, as we, as we call them as well. So that's uh, that's the region I want to go back when the, the pandemic is over and I can actually come over again. The other uh, thing I, I really like is, uh, is obviously Switzerland because that's my home country. And uh, we have nice mountains, no deserts. When we have lakes, uh, mountain lakes, uh, when we can shoot reflections, reflecting Milky Ways, and uh, we have really nice mountains. Uh, they look a little bit like the Rockies in, in the U.S. Um, that's another place I obviously like to shoot, and that's in my, my backyard. So that's a bit easier for me to reach. Fantastic. And for our listeners, before we head out today, Ralph is going to share his website where you can see these fantastic images. And by the way, there's one image in particular, or actually I would say two. One, the opportunity to shoot the Milky Way up in the mountains with the mountain lake is just, I would love to do that. I think that'd be phenomenal. But you have a shot, which I'm going to guess, you'll correct me if I'm not correct, probably from uh, Great Basin National Park or somewhere where the bristlecone pines are. You have a shot looking up through the bristlecone pine of the Milky Way. And for our listeners, the bristlecone pine is probably one of, is probably the oldest tree in the world. And some of these, the age of these trees, they don't look like they're alive. And you're going to see these shots on Rolf's website. But the, these these predate you know, the time of, I guess, the pyramids, I think. But yeah, they're like 6,000 years. Yeah. That, exactly. and that shot of it is just like, it was just blowing me away. And uh, I have to tell you, I share this with you. My friend Linda is a photographer. She's a very good photographer. She's up in Chicago, where I just moved from last year. She's coming out here uh, in May. And I shared your website with her this morning said this this is who i'm interviewing today because i wanted her to get ready to to amp up her game a little bit okay she's gonna (laughs) she's gonna bring her a game she's gonna come out here and do some shooting (laughs) so how has this interest in you know the landscape astrophotography the deep space work how has that changed your life some people have just hobbies. Yeah. This is more than this is a very yeah, it's a, deep, it's addictive. Deeply, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the shop, by the way, was not in uh, Great Basin. I was in uh, the White Mountains in uh, California. It's an uh, ancient Bristol Cone uh, National Monument where I took it. All right. Thanks a lot, Ross. But thanks there a lot. are Bristol Cones <laughs> in, uh, in Great Basin as well. I've been there, uh, but actually, I didn't do any astro there because it was a. Uh, uh, it was cloudy when I was there. It okay. was just one day and it was very windy. So I, I took some shots, but just in, in front of my tent on the camera. Okay. Okay. Fair okay. enough. I don't mind. I'm I'm big <laughs> I'm man enough that I can be corrected 
<laughs> online. So thank you very much. So <laughs> that is yeah, a beautiful shot. changed my, my life. I, I obviously it changed my, my vacation uh, scheduling because uh, I have started to, to, as you mentioned, to schedule my uh, vacations around New Moon. And I, before the pandemic, I tried to, to get away from my family for, for like one week and uh, travel to some place in, in, on the world to, to specifically do astrophotography. Um, that, that's one of the changes. I sleep less. <laughs> so sleep is totally overrated. No, I'm kidding. Sleep is extremely important. But uh, as an astrophotographer, obviously, you, you do not sleep very much uh, when you're shooting. So um, I'm a little bit tired in my days off than I, I normally were before. So that's, uh, that's another change. And uh, well, another change was when I see a, a great image today, online or somewhere of, a, of, a, of an awesome landscape, I immediately start questioning myself, okay, is it possible to capture this scene with a starry sky above it? So I get uh, my planning apps. I, I try to find where the uh, shot was taken. I get my planning apps and start planning. Well, okay, does it work as a Milky Way or does it work in winter as a riot on th- uh, above it? Uh, what direction must this uh, take and, and so on. And then if, it, I, if I decide it's a possibility, I just put a, a flag on Google Maps and uh, I want to go there. <laughs> My Google Maps is full of those green flags. I want to go there. <laughs> My bucket list keeps, uh, keeps growing. <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, you know, eventually you're going to say, you know, if I interviewed um, Peter Zelinka. I don't know if you know yeah. that name. Uh, a couple weeks ago, in fact, his episode should be published not this coming week, but the week after. And looking forward to that. It's a yeah, great, great yeah. shot. Oh, I mean, it was just when I was starting to do my research. He was his was one of the first ones that that I realized. Okay, this is what I need, and I bought, ended up buying the uh, the move shoot move yeah. rotator. And I'm not because I figured I needed to get that piece down correctly, then work on the post-processing. And once I got those two, then I could upgrade to some of the, like the equipment you're using. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good uh, amount to start this. That's becoming very popular right now. Yeah. What kind of shooting are you doing while you are in the airplane? Because I noticed you've got a couple of pictures. In fact, you wrote a little bit about this in uh, Milky Way Photographers Online Magazine about shooting inside the airplane. And yeah. is there any nuance to that? Because there actually, that's, that's a in, very interesting perspective. There's the, the, sky, the land below you, and then there's the Milky Way. How are you accomplishing that? Well, Basically, it's it's very similar to to landscape astrophotography uh, from a fixed tripod. Obviously, I kind of install a tracker in an airplane, um, so it's uh, basically fixed uh, tripod astrophotography. Although it might sound a bit funny if I talk about fixed when you're flying in an airplane, <laughs> but. Uh, what I basically uh, started with uh, is what some passengers do. You see them uh, images online. I'm just holding my camera to the to the window and uh, just bumping up the ISO to like twelve thousand eight hundred and trying to shoot the series and hoping that I get uh, one or two of them sharp. So I decided that's probably not the best way to do it. And then I saw those uh, suction mounts where you have suction cups. You can do that, uh, fix that driver to a window. And as we have uh, pretty big windows in the flight deck, I have, an, I have an advantage. So I can actually fix my camera to the tripod. And then there are those uh, lens skirts, they're called. You can do, uh, use them uh, yourself as a, as a little bit of string and, and the cloth, or you can buy them commercially for like uh, $50. And they, uh, you put them on top of your lens and they uh, avoid the reflections in the windows. So I was uh, starting to, to put my, my camera to the window and, and start shooting like this. I'm still a very high eye, so I normally work with like uh, 12,800 or 6,400. Uh, and uh, 
a fast lens. So I have an uh, f1.4 lens, which I almost stop down to f2 though. And then I take like five to 10 second shots. And I take a, a long series, like I shoot for 20 minutes. I just leave the camera there because I have to fly the airplane. <laughs> 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 and uh, I just leave it there and let it run. And then uh, after 20 minutes, I shut it down um, and check uh, at home what I got. And then normally I get quite a few sharp uh, images with sharp stars. I even have uh, successfully stacked some of them, like 10 or 12 shots in a row. They have a... Uh, the reasonably sharp. So I was actually to, able to stack them with this, the, the, the Sequator on Windows, which is mm. free, a great freeware program right. uh, for stacking, especially uh, shots from uh, from fixed tripod. Very nice. So that's Very actually nice. what I do. <laughs> Fly the plane. I, I, I really like to <laughs> to emphasize that because. I have a co-pilot next to me because people normally ask me, yeah, how, how do you do that when you're supposed to fly the plane? Okay, I do that only on cruise level where the workload is really low. Um, I mean, if, if one of the pilots has to visit the toilet, we are alone in the fly deck. So that's not a problem to, to, to do all the stuff as a single pilot for like five minutes. And that's all it takes me to, to put the camera to the window and start the imaging sequence. And then I can just leave it there, let it run, and I, I do my chop again. <laughs> All right. You know, I don't think you really needed to qualify, you know, this uh, description, but we'll leave it in. But I am curious, you know, you, you fly fairly regularly, you know, and take your camera with you everywhere. Yeah. What do your coworkers, the rest of the flight crew, the, the, the cabin crew, what do they think of, Captain Rohner's hobby. <laughs> well, and normally they only want to see uh, the images I shoot when I say, well, what are you doing there? So they're like, I'm um, uh, photographing the, the stars out there. And they know, oh, okay, can you show me an image? And then normally I take my phone and show them uh, a few images that I took out of the plane. And then uh, they'll become interested. Okay, yeah. Well, and some of them, uh, especially co pilots, uh, have started doing the same now. <laughs> they are. Even ask me to fly with them so I can show them how I do. You know, I think that's wonderful. There, there is a whole YouTube genre culture of individuals where the in the planes they have the little, uh, I guess they call them GoPros. Yeah, and they're they're basically assembling the Go uh, recording the trip and especially like the takeoff, the landing, the taxing, which. Again, I think is wonderful. It's the landing that I think is the most wonderful is that, you know, you're just, you're kind of lining up to the runway and all yeah. the things that are going on. And that's my favorite part. But what has been the kind of the biggest, I don't know what you call them, aha or insight. And I kind of asked you about it during the preparation for this episode. But looking back at the biggest change in your life is how has this hobby impacted you, Rolf? Well, uh, one of the, the big ahas was when I was starting to do landscape astrophotography, I didn't consider myself a, a very good uh, deep sky imager. Actually, it was uh, just as a hobby and it was, uh, it was okay, but it was producing, but it was not nothing to, to write home about <laughs> or to, to put online. You don't find that my, my early images online. And then uh, when I did that camping uh, vacation with my family, I got that tractor and all the stuff. And uh, I was basically applying the same techniques uh, I was applying for deep sky. Um, I was working on my computer at home to, to put these images together, to process them. And my wife told me, okay, if you are always sitting in front of your computer, you better do something with your images and you better put them online or something. And I opened the Flickr account and I, I uploaded them uh, uh, on Flickr. And that's when I got uh, some feedback from some very good photographers, uh, like, uh, for example, Royce Bear. Um, which you, who we can get, certainly know. I bought his ebook, Pride and Advocation, to, to learn a, a little bit about uh, how to expose well, what the settings were and, and all the stuff. And then after like three months, I uh, was posting my 
images in the book. I got an email from Roy's parents. And they, what are you doing there? It's just this uh, tracking and stacking stuff. And that looks quite good. And he actually used a uh, few of my images for one of his presentations. And that's when my name became a little bit more known in the US. And I, all of a sudden, I was asked from some uh, really good photographers, uh, hey, can you explain me what you do there and stuff? And I said, like, oh, there's something going on. Um, I noticed that many at that uh, in these those days at least many of those uh, landscape acid photographers actually came from la- uh, from landscape daylight photography. They were like uh, just shooting daylight and uh, sunsets, and then they started to hang around a little longer, <laughs> and, and it started to become dark, and they were starting to shoot stars. But they actually didn't know very much about deep space imaging techniques. Um, so I decided it might be good to, to tell people how I do that to help them to become uh, better or at least uh, technically more advanced uh, astrophotographers. Um, it's awesome to see how this uh, field has developed today. Uh, stacking and tracking is a standard procedure. And it's just five years now. And that uh, has, has changed quite a bit. And also because my name is a little bit well known, uh, better known. If I go on trips, uh, I always uh, can meet people uh, who want to shoot with me. And, uh, that's nice as well. So I, I like to work alone at night because I'm more efficient. But also I like company because it's, it's great if you can do that uh, together with, uh, with somebody else or, or two or uh, three persons and you, you have fun together. Well... Uh, first, well, two things. One, I want to tell you the same thing I, I shared with Peter Zalika. When you come out this way, I'm your guy. Okay? <laughs> um, and the other is, you know, there's this is an opportunity, I think, for folks to get outside, enjoy this, themselves, That's breathe nothing. fresh air. And, you know, you're learning something new, but it's also, you know, if coming out for me to Las Vegas has been a, a godsend because I can get in my car and I can go out to the Mojave or to Lake Mead or Red Rocks to the national parks. And it's an opportunity to really enjoy your hobby and not just feel like, what am I going to do? But uh, it is nice to, like you said, be around others yes. while you're doing it. Is your, your wife or your kids, anybody else inclined to say, Hey, I want to go with you. Yeah, my kids, definitely. <laughs> my kids want to go with me. They're, they're nine now. Um, I already took them uh, on uh, some trips, uh, obviously not on the, the more dangerous ones. If I go on a steep mountain or if I go out in winter in uh, minus 10 degrees centigrade, I don't want to have the kids with me. Right. But in summer, uh, it's great fun to take them along, uh, put up a tent somewhere in the mountains and do some sky- stargazing while, while I'm shooting in parallel. That's uh, that's awesome. My wife, a little bit less. She doesn't like camping too much, but uh, but she doesn't have a problem if I take the kids along. Fantastic. Yeah, it gives her a little bit of a wait time, so, which is exactly. nice. <laughs> so, Ralph, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Uh, one site where actually I learned uh, from is, is from uh, Roy Spears' uh, website. Um, it's, it's, it's awesome. And they're uh, Milky Way photographers. They have uh, written a few articles uh, for it. It's another great uh, website. Um, on uh, Petopixels, you'll find a few articles about uh, nightscape photography. That's uh, another good uh, site. And then you just uh, Google Milky Way nightscape, so Milky Way photography, and you have uh, a ton of, uh, of really good uh, tutorials you can find. Okay. Now you have a website, uh, uh, Rolf uh, hyphen Roner dot pixels, where many of your images are available for purchase. Yes. And uh, so we want to encourage your listeners to to our listeners to go out there. If anything, just look at what Ralph's work is. Well, look at what he's done. He's doing this is beautiful. And if you're inclined and you think it's going to look good in your home or in the office, 
take advantage of it. I appreciate um, it. <laughs> yeah. And you are, you're also on Facebook. You're on Flickr. You've got, we'll put your Flickr. Yeah. Uh, Flickr, uh, Facebook, Instagram. You find me under the name Skypointer2000. Okay. Skypointer2000. Well, exactly. we'll definitely provide the backlinks to those sites and we'll get Roy Spears website as well. There was one question and it's, oh, how can I forget this? In our on our main webpage, successinsightpodcast.com, we often put yeah, a handful, three, four pictures on our show notes just to give our listeners and readers of the show notes and an opportunity to see your work. Would you mind sharing a couple shots with us that we can put on our on our webpage? No, no, no. Of course. Sure. Fantastic. Yeah, Fantastic. Now, Ralph, before we head out, any other insight that you would like to leave our listeners with? I mean, you're an accomplished pilot, photographer, astrophotographer, you know, again, dare I say, an icon in this world of, you know, deep sky, uh, dark sky, astrophotography. Any words of insight that you would like to leave our listeners? Well, just something I learned already in flight school. And uh, one of my flight instructors told me, uh, Proper preparation prevents poor performance. They call that the famous five Ps. Um, that's true in aviation, but it's exactly the same in photography. And especially in landscape astrophotography. Because you, of course, you can go out and just look uh, at the stars and uh, start shooting. But as you mentioned, the moon phase is important and the season is important. The Milky Way is not always, uh, at least the Milky Way core is not always visible. And it's uh, standing in another direction and standing uh, at another angle. So it's good to know all this stuff and to actually plan your image. So actually, when I go out shooting, I have a, an image in my mind I want to capture. And I probably know up to a few meters where I want to put my tripod up to capture that image. There are great uh, tools uh, for planning like uh, uh, Planet Pro app or PhotoPills app or a TP app where you can plan those shots at home on your phone or on your iPad. Um, actually have uh, quite a good idea when you go into the field what you want to achieve. So do your planning is very important. Do all of your planning with uh, the stuff you uh, Take along. I'm not talking about uh, photo gear, but about the uh, clothing, maybe bear sprays uh, if you're in bear country, and all the stuff for your own safety. Because you're alone, maybe alone uh, out there at night in, in the wild, and they're wild animals. They're not the most dangerous uh, thing you might encounter. It's probably just, uh, still the human beings you might encounter out there. But nevertheless, better be safe than sorry. So you take your warm clothes and you can get very cold at night in the desert. I noticed 40 uh, degrees centigrade during the day and below freezing at night. So you take your, your uh, you really have to plan your, your stuff, take enough water and, and all that stuff and do your planning, stay safe out there and know actually what you're trying to achieve. Fantastic. At the same time, you have to stay flexible enough if you go somewhere you do your scouting and see a totally different scene you don't know about. You just skip everything you were planning and you do that all the shots. So you do your planning, know what you want to do, but keep your eyes open out there and this and the opportunity arises. Skip your plans and do the other thing. That's important as well. Stay flexible. Flexible. I love it. I love it. And, uh, you know, for our listeners, we're going to share some links back also to the articles that, Ralph wrote on uh, Milky Way Photographer's website, and there's actually one story in particular about an encounter with some wildlife that turned out okay. However, yeah. it was when I read it, I have to say I kind of was laughing. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, okay. I was shooting in the you ain't the mountains uh, in Utah uh -huh. at the uh, at the lake shore, and I was actually shooting at 360 degrees panorama, and that was the uh, Closest, totally dark. So I had black trousers, a black jacket on. Uh, no lights, obviously. If you want to shoot the stars, you don't want light around you, except maybe some low level lighting, but I didn't do that there. So I was in the complete dark, dark closest. And uh, 
when I was shooting with my back to the water, the other direction, all of a sudden I heard loud splashes right behind me. All <laughs> right. And we're going to leave it right there because we're going to get our listeners to go out there and find out what it was and <laughs> let them have a laugh. So Ralph, it was an absolute pleasure to have you on uh, the Success Inside podcast, our outdoor adventure series. And Really, again, it's been a, pl- a pleasure, a pl- true pleasure just to learn about your journey and this your wonderful work. And I'm excited to, I hope to now call you a friend and look forward to when you get out here to the U.S. or yeah, I get to Switzerland is to break bread and go take some photographs. Yeah, do that. <laughs> All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Ralph Rohner. He is an accomplished landscape astrophotographer, deep sky photographer. He's a pilot. He captains a Boeing 777-300ER and really just a wonderful, wonderful individual. And just the work that he has produced, and I, I can't tell you enough, you know, this is the pleasure of having him here on the podcast and to share a little bit about his journey. So we hope you, Ralph, enjoyed our podcast uh, interview today, and we look forward to sharing that with our listeners as well. And find us on successinsightpodcast.com, as well as on our Facebook and LinkedIn pages, Success Insight Podcast. And we are on the major podcasting platforms, Google Podcast, Apple Podcasts. Amazon Music, Spotify, and inside Spotify, we have the Outdoor Adventure Series playlist, which we'll also share a link there. So you can not only hear about Ralph, but you're going to hear about the other individuals we've interviewed for our Outdoor Adventure Series, including Peter Zelenka. So really some great episodes. And do let us know what you think about these episodes by sending us emails, commenting on the episode comment fields. But, you know, again, this is just a great opportunity, especially outdoor adventures. Get out there, enjoy yourself, take your friends, take your family, get some fresh air and explore. And as Ralph had said, be prepared. Make sure you are prepared for the environments that you are going into. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, Go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on the next episode of the Success Inside Podcast, and we have more episodes to come for the Outdoor Adventure Series. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.